Uh, today's message is titled Hills and Valleys, and I subtitled it, The Lord is My Shepherd. If the Lord is our shepherd, then that can only mean one thing, right? We are his sheep. If he is a shepherd and he is ours, that makes us his sheep. Shepherd means sheep herder. In other words, Jesus Christ is responsible for you. Jesus Christ is the one that is responsible for his flock. And there is no better person in all the universe than the Lord Jesus Christ in his great and awesome care for us, right? Amen. He is all good, he is all loving, and he is all powerful. Yes. If he was all good and all loving, but he wasn't all powerful, we got problems. Because <laughs> that would be a nice guy that can do nothing. But he's not just anyone, he's the shepherd God. And he loves you. And he cares for you. And today, he's going to minister to you through his word. To give you an idea of the sad reality of the nature of, she of sheep, here's a true story. While a shepherd was tending his sheep, there were approximately 300 of them. A friend shows up and he invites him to a quick lunch break. The shepherd tells his friend, I can't. I have to watch my sheep. You know how sheep are. So his friend says, come on, we'll be quick. Grab a sandwich, chow it down, get back to work. So the shepherd decides to have a quick lunch break with his friend. Long story short, one of the sheep has a bright idea. And that idea is to wander off. And not too far away was a dangerous cliff. And the other sheep figure, uh, this bright sheep must know where he's going and what he's doing. So why don't we just all follow him? And all 300 sheep walk right over the cliff to their death. One little wandering sheep got every other sheep in trouble. That's the reason why we don't follow sheep, we follow the shepherd. We don't follow people, we follow Christ. The poor shepherd lost his beloved sheep worth about sixty to $70,000. That's a, a true story. This is just one example of how sheep cannot survive without their shepherd. That's just the reality of the nature of sheep. They cannot do it alone. Left alone, they die. They get into trouble. They get into places where they can't get themselves out of. In fact, if a sheep tips over and nobody picks them right side up, that sheep is dead. Not too long from the moment he fell over. And it's the same for us today. You have to realize that you cannot survive without your shepherd. We are totally and completely dependent on Him. We need Jesus. And it's a good thing that our God and Good Shepherd doesn't take lunch breaks, right? Because <laughs> if He did, one right after the other, I guarantee you that. <laughs> and so we can see also that Jesus Christ relates with us as sheep. The Bible calls Him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But he's not a dumb sheep like us. He was a wise sheep who was totally dependent on the Father, his shepherd, throughout his life and his entire ministry. And as sheep, we too, again, are to be totally dependent on the Father. And so he relates to us in one sense. He made himself a man and to fully and completely rely on his Father as a sheep does a shepherd. Make sense? And so Jesus is the shepherd, and he is also the Lamb of God. Turn the revelation of God then to Psalm chapter 23. Psalm 23. This is a beloved psalm, but it only belongs to the true sheep and children of God. Let us stand to our feet for the initial reading of God's word, if you are able to. Starting there in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd... I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. 
Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may be seated. It was so extremely difficult to concise this message, but I did the best I can. If I went all out, we'd go on for at least two hours. I always tell my wife, I don't know what to take off. I got like two more pages. <sighs> we got to go back to the first century, right? Where Paul preached into the midnight and Eutychus falls out of the window and dies. <laughs> Poor guy. And then Paul revives him and he keeps preaching. That's a true preacher. It's like, get over it, dude. Let's get back into the Word. (laughs) Psalm 23 is about 3,000 plus years old. And it's the most popular psalm of all. As you guys know, especially when it comes to funerals and memorial services. Think about that. How many times has this psalm not been recited? How many times has this psalm not been preached? How many times has this song not been sung? I mean, even worldly people know this song. It's just a very popular song, and it's 3,000 years old. And as we read it, it feels as though God just gave it to us freshly, if you have the right heart and mind when receiving God's Word. But really, this song is far more about life than it is about death. Many people use it at funeral services, but in reality, this psalm is not really about death. It's about abundant life. And it's important to notice where this psalm is positioned. Psalm 23 follows Psalm 22, right? What's interesting is Psalm 22 speaks of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the cross of our Good Shepherd And that makes Psalm 23 possible. In other words, if there is no Psalm 22, then there is no Psalm 23. It is only through the cross of Christ that we can enjoy the abundant life in Christ. Psalm 23 is only possible because Psalm 22 is there. And I think that's the reason why the psalm is positioned these two chapters side by side in the correct order first the cross then peace with God first the cross then eternal life can I get an amen Amen. you put your trust in Jesus and you get the life of God eternal life you live forever this is a quantity of life and a quality of life and so Jesus is both the shepherd that leads us to heaven and the lamb that died for us and for our sins to make that possible He's a shepherd, he leads, he's the lamb, he dies in our place as the sinless lamb of God. Also notice Psalm 23 is written in an up, down, up sequence. A high, low, high pattern. It's a kind of roller coaster flow if you really pay attention to it. For example, it starts with David blissfully enjoying green hills, which are a picture of Israel's grassy hills to finding himself in the valley of the shadow of death. He starts on the hills, comes down to the valley, to finally end up at the king of kings table. That's what you're reading. You're reading up, down, up. Again, it's a sunshine, darkness, sunshine sequence. And this is a perfect picture of the Christian life, isn't it? At times, it's a kind of roller coaster ride. First you're up, then you're down, then you're up again. And for those who like roller coasters, kind of enjoy that. But the roller coasters in life are not that enjoyable at times. Can I get an amen? And so one day you're dancing on hills, and the next day you're depressed in the valley, right? One day you're dancing high, and one day you're depressed low. This is why I titled today's sermon, Hills and Valleys. But always keep in mind that this beloved psalm ends with us again dining with the shepherd king. That's how it ends. It ends with us dining with God. This psalm points to Jesus being our shepherd from verses 1 to 4. 
And it points to Jesus being our king from verses 5 to 6. I think it's the best way to understand this chapter. From verses 1 to 4, we are his sheep. From verses 5 to 6, we are his special guest of honor. We can say that verses 1 to 4 takes place on earth, while verses 5 to 6 takes place in heaven at the great marriage supper of the Lamb. Where does your life end up, no matter what it is you go through? At the table of God. So hard times come and go. Lows come and go. And one day we will be on an eternal high, an eternal up, an eternal sunshine, literally, where there will be no more darkness. And the face of Christ will be the light that radiates throughout all the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth. Can I get an amen? Amen. King David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Go back to verse 1 for a moment and look at that line. The Lord is my shepherd. This is very personal. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I heard the story of a shepherd who was ministering to an under shepherd. He was a shepherd in training. This older shepherd would tell the young shepherd the best way to remember this first line is to use all five of your fingers and start this way. The Lord is my ring finger shepherd. And he was trying to win this young man for Christ while teaching him how to tend sheep. He wasn't too sure if the the young man ever gave his life to Christ before a tragic evening occurred. It was a very cold evening. It was snowing outside. But this young man cared about the sheep more than he cared about his own life. And so he took chances. He stayed out there in the field while the teacher shepherd is at home. Turns out the kid dies. Someone comes to the the shepherd that was teaching the young man and he tells him, I've got bad news. The young man you were trained up to be a shepherd like yourself, we found him dead, frozen in the field. He says, but something really interesting was observed. And and the older shepherd said, what is it? He was found holding his ring finger. The Lord is my shepherd. At that moment, the older shepherd said, he's in heaven. He is saved. He got it. And so we have to have that same mentality. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord here is speaking of Yahweh. If you read this passage in Hebrew, it would say Yahweh, which means self-existing one. Now think about that. That means that this Lord, this shepherd, needs nothing at all. That's a good thing. Because I need things, and you need things, everyone needs things. Now, if your shepherd has no needs and can provide all of your needs, that's a great shepherd. Can I get an amen? And there is no one better than him. If you want to remember something today, remember that. There is no one better than the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just an under-shepherd and an under-pastor. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd and the chief pastor. And so like John the Baptist, I say, follow him. Don't follow me. Don't follow man. Don't follow anyone else. You follow your chief and good shepherd. If you want to go to heaven, right? Follow Jesus. By the way, shepherd is the same as pastor. The word pastor comes from the word pastures, pastures. Pastor means to lead to pastures. So that's the reason why it's the same as shepherd. Shepherd and pastor are the same thing, which is lush green grass for sheep to happily feed on. That is the shepherd's job, both the chief shepherd, the great shepherd, the good shepherd, and all of us little tiny under shepherds. Again, King David says, my, the Lord is my shepherd. When was the last time you said that? When was the last time you said that with an attitude of absolute gratitude? The Lord is my shepherd. You should be able to say that, and that should be a reality in your life. You should be able to say that, just like King David. King David says, he is my shepherd. This is purely personal. David didn't write this psalm with everyone in mind. When he wrote this psalm, he wasn't necessarily thinking of the nation of Israel. 
He was just thinking about his relationship with God. This was a personal song between him and his God. And if anyone knows what it means to be a shepherd, it's King David, as you all know. As a young boy, he led sheep, and as a grown man, he led people, the entire nation of Israel. In fact, when it was time to take down Goliath, King David had to tell King Saul, I whooped bears and lions with my bare hands. Let me at him. He's talking negatively about God and his people. Give me a shot. And he got that shot. Right to the forehead, between the eyes, man goes down, takes Goliath's sword, chops his head off. That is a picture of the shepherd king, Jesus Christ, conquering sin, death, and hell on your behalf. It's not a story about you or me. It's all about him. So the question is, is Jesus truly your shepherd? Or is he only David's shepherd? Or is he only your dad's shepherd? Or is he only your spouse's shepherd? Or is he only your pastor's shepherd? If you want to make it to the king's table in heaven, he must be your shepherd. He must be your shepherd. And I'm not talking about just saying it. A robot can be programmed to say, the Lord is my shepherd. That's not what we're looking for. We're talking about the Spirit of God residing within you. You know you're born again. You know you got a new heart. You know where you're going when you die. And with all of that reality in you, you say, the Lord is my shepherd. He might be everyone else's shepherd. I don't know, but he's mine. He's mine. And I wouldn't trade him for the world. That's when you know the value of your shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. In other words, they're not staying in the valley when they're in it. They will not perish under my care, not completely, not fully, and not eternally. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus' is true sheep hear his voice, which is the Holy Bible. More specifically, the red letters in the New Testament. But the entire word is the word of Christ. All 66 books. Again, especially Jesus' teaching. And those who are truly his sheep, they believe every word. They love it and they obey it best they can as the Spirit gives them strength. Are you familiar with the voice of Jesus, which is the word of God? And the question is, do you follow it? So, so do you know his voice and do you follow him when you hear his clear teachings and his clear commands? That's the question. If not, you can't claim Psalm 23 for yourself. If the voice of Jesus isn't the ultimate voice in your life, you cannot say the Lord is my shepherd. But if he is the ultimate voice in your life, he can tell you where to go, tell you what to believe, tell you what to do, then you know that he is your shepherd. If so, he is indeed your shepherd too, not just David's. And then David goes on to say there again, going back to Psalm 23 and verse 1, I shall not want. There's a lot of wanting in this world, right? And when people get stuff, they want more stuff. And when they get more stuff, they're unhappy with the more stuff they get. So they want more stuff and more stuff and more stuff and more stuff, right? That's the way this world is. That's the way our fallen nature is. We want to fill ourselves with the things of the world, but you cannot be filled with the things of the world. Only the God who made you can satisfy you. He's the only one who can fill that God-shaped hole in your heart. Our Lord is the only one who can truly satisfy our souls. He does this with His nearness. In other words, he satisfies our souls with his nearness, with his presence, with his favor, with his goodness, with his kindness, his spiritual and physical provisions, and they are many. With his mercy, with his forgiveness of sin, if it was just that alone, it's amazing, right? His wisdom, his help, his truth, his heaven after death, and so on and so forth. 
That's how he satisfies your soul. He says, I shall not want. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs. You can underline that word all if you want and highlight it. According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And sometimes he supplies even our wants, doesn't he? Yes. Mm-hmm. As long as we are delighting in him. Amen. The word of God promises that the Lord will give you the desires of your heart if and when you delight in him. But he will never supply our selfish greeds because they are harmful to us. See, that's the reason why I'm totally satisfied in the Lord. I don't complain about what I have or don't have. I have everything in Christ. We are extremely blessed. You can't be more rich than you are now if you are in Christ. 23 and verse 2, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Sheep are naturally fearful and uneasy creatures by nature. They're just very fretful. And at times we are too. Can I get an amen or an ouch? They need help and assistance to rest. We need help and assistance to rest in our minds and in our fussy spirit. Jesus makes us rest in Him. Notice He says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes it happen. In one way or another, God will make sure that you rest in the Prince of Peace. He will make sure that you enjoy His peace. And sometimes, He might have to take you through the valley to see your need for Him. To get that peace. Verse 2 also says, He leads me beside still waters. He leads me beside still waters. Do you notice that this shepherd is a a great comforter and a great provider, great leader. He leads him to still waters, not to the kinds of things that destroy a person's life. But water is one of the main source of life for us humans. Without food, we die. Without oxygen, water will die. But even more, without Christ, we die completely, both physically and spiritually. Sheep are scared of rushing waters because if they fall in, they will most likely not be able to get out. Why? Because if they get close to rushing water, they become fretful and then they lose their balance. They're kind of clumsy too. And then they just fall in after trying to take a drink. They get dizzy and their wool will soak up the water and they will just sink to the bottom and drown. They need the shepherd to quickly pull them out if they fall into the waters, so do you and so do I. Can I get an amen? Amen. So the waters need to be calm in order for them to drink, and the Lord makes sure that that's the case. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 40 and verse 11. Beautiful Old Testament picture of our shepherd God. Isaiah 40 and verse 11 says of God, He will feed His flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs, that's the little ones, with his arms. Because there are times when a shepherd will be out in the valley or on the hills and the little ones will get a little tired. And so the shepherd would scoop them up and carry them. Like us daddies have done in Disneyland right after being there for six hours. It says, and carry them in his bosom, that's by his chest, near his heart, and gently lead those who are with young. So those of you who have young ones, those of you who are moms with young ones, Jesus has a special care for you. Because he knows how much more difficult it is for you than for someone else. This is our good shepherd. He takes care of all of us in special and specific ways. Psalm 23 and verse 3, He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. In other words, He is responsible for us. For His name's sake. In one sense, His name is on the line. If He said, you are my sheep and it's true, He's going to make sure that He takes care of you. Why? Because In one sense, his reputation is on the line. 
If he says he'll save you and doesn't save you, if you're truly his, then he has failed as a shepherd and as a savior. That's why he says, for his name's sake. The Lord makes sure that you are restored. The Lord makes sure that he leads you to paths of righteousness. Why? Because again, his name is on the line. That makes me feel comfortable. (laughs) If he's responsible for me, I'm good. The word restore means that he turns us back to himself. As the old hymn says, we are prone to what? Wander. It's true. Isaiah 53 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. So when we backslide, when we decide to eat from artificial grass (laughs) in this world, instead of the lush green grass of God, which is his word, his truth, his ways, He has to pull out the crook, that is the staff, and bring us back to himself. You are feeding in the wrong place. You're going to end up throwing up that green plastic. Little sheep, get back over here. You're going to get a tummy ache with that fake stuff. Or if the sheep becomes a gadabout sheep, again, just wanders off and gets lost. Or we stumble into sin, or we follow after harmful things, he brings us back. And he restores our soul. In other words, he brings about a fresh sense of peace between us and him. In other words, he repairs the relationship. When you're his son, you're always his son. When you're his daughter, you're always his daughter. But at times, we live and act in disappointing ways and we do our own thing. And God has to bring us back to a tight relationship with him again. Can I get an amen? He puts us back on the path of righteousness. God's good ways. He does that. If you fall into sin and God brings you back, you're His. If you go into the world for some time and God brings you back, you're His. If you are His, you will be His forever. He makes sure that He brings His sheep back to Himself. Why? Because they are His sheep, which means they are His responsibility. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. You were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. When he says, I do this for my name's sake, he is saying, I'm the supervisor, I'm the overseer, as far as the completion of our salvation. Going back to Psalm 23 and verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, if the second part of that verse wasn't there, then we would be hopeless. But we know it's because you are with me. I mean, obviously we will fear evil if he's not with us. Right? The valley of the shadow of death refers to hardships of all kinds. Hardships of all kinds. If you've been told by the doctor that you now have cancer, that's the valley of the shadow of death. If you have been told that a loved one has passed away, that is the valley of the shadow of death. If you are going through some serious emotional and mental and relational issues, that is a taste of the valley of the shadow of death. But you notice we always walk through the hardships of life and even when we die, As you know, we have passed from what? Death to life. Death to life. life. That's a picture of the middle part of this psalm. Life, death to life. We go through the valley of the shadow of death. Somehow, someway, God is going to get us through it. And if He doesn't get you through it here, I can guarantee you He'll get you through it up there. If you are His, it is a sure deal. Because up there, the Bible says that he wipes away all of our tears, doesn't he? The valley of the shadow of death no longer has a trace on our face, in our minds, or in our hearts. Why? It's gone. To never be visited again. But right now, we might be there. But as long as he's there too, let's go through it. What else are we going to do? Where else are you going to go? What did Jesus tell Peter? Where else are you going to go, Peter? Go ahead and go. Everyone else is leaving me. John 6, 6, 6, ironically. And Peter says, no, where else are we going to go if you got the words of eternal life? You need to feel that way when you are in the darkest pit of your life. 
Where else am I going to go? Who else is going to reach me from here? Who else is going to rescue me? Like Him. The Lord is with us. And we will fear no evil because of that. Death no longer has its sting. When we die, we will rise again and our good shepherd will make sure of it. How do you get through it? Jesus makes sure you get through it. And some sheep, as you guys know, are very, very traviesos, hard-headed, stiff-necked. The shepherd starts pulling them and they start kicking. I want to stay in this valley a little longer. So sometimes it really does depend on our trust in the shepherd. When he leads us, follow. The quicker you do it, the quicker you get to the promised land. Can I get an amen? amen? You don't want to be like the children of Israel in the desert for 40 years. I'm sick of this after 40 minutes. Lord, do something to my mind and heart. I need you. We need him. And many times it's in the valley that we experience some of the sweetest times with our Lord. You know what I'm talking about. It's like you didn't know God until you went through the valley. Job, oh, I heard about you, but now my eyes see you. It's there when we learn about his love for us and of his power over our tough situations most, where? In the darkest of times. That's when he comes through as the deliverer, as the rescuer, as the hero. And by the way, he's the only hero in this story. Also, shadows can't destroy us, right? It's called the shadow of death. Shadows can't harm you. Death can't harm the Christian. Not really. Not eternally. Can the shadow of a shark destroy you? Answer? No. Can the shadow of a lion destroy you? No. Can the shadow of a shotgun destroy you? No. In the same way, the shadow of death cannot destroy us utterly. Why? Because Jesus took the sting of death, which is the penalty of sin, away. When we die, we are raised again in newness of life and into a glorified state. A place where we never die again. We never mourn again. We never sin again. We never worry again. We never fear again. We never want again in an earthly sense, in a nessial sense. He says, your rod and your staff, they come for me. All right? So you can just imagine a little sheep looking at the rod of the shepherd. That rod is really a club. It's what the shepherd uses to hit the wolf over the head with. <laughs> you know, it's like if you're in a dangerous place and, and the person you're with has a gun. You're like, there's a little bit of safety there. But this, this rod, this... This club is not in the hand of some man or some tough guy. It's in the hand of God, the shepherd God. And so that's the reason why he's comforted by his rod. He's like, he's got a weapon and there's no one stronger and better than him. Let's go through anything. His power, his care for us, his defense is what brings our soul's comfort. Can I get an amen? amen. And it says, and the staff... So your rod and your staff, they comfort me, and the staff is the tool used to pull sheep in and to block their way if they are going the wrong way like a long arm. When sheep start going the wrong way, he pulls out the staff and tries to make them go the right way. So the rod is a picture of God's protection. The staff is a picture of God's direction. And we need it. We need both, don't we? And so that, that staff is like a long arm. It's also known as a crook. It's got that hook. So with the rod, he protects, and with the staff, he directs. And again, both of these instruments are in the hands of the chief shepherd, the lover of our souls. Now here's the transition from being a sheep in the presence of the shepherd to being a special guest in the presence of the king of kings. There's a transition here. Even he goes from being a shepherd in one sense to being a host, to being a royal host, the king. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I believe that again in the end as we read in the book of Revelation, 
a table will be prepared in heaven for us at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you will be seated with your king. And Satan will know it. And all of hell will know it. And you will be seated, safely served and loved by your unfailing king. I can't wait for that moment. He says, you anoint my head with oil. That's an ancient Middle Eastern practice. You come to someone's house, someone who's hospitable. As soon as you walk in, as you know, they'll wash your feet and they'll put oil on your head, oil on your face to refresh you, to cause your face to shine. And he says, my cup runs over. In other words, when the Lord pours into our cups, he holds it there. You're looking at it like, Lord, it's, it's spilling over. I know. Don't worry about it. Just drink it up. Because this is how my hand stays for all of eternity. I never pick it back up. I hold it over you forever. I want to drink from that cup. I want to drink from that hand. Verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Again, this is the Father's house in heaven. This is to be in the family of God forever. This is amazing, folks. David understands that if he's my shepherd and he's my king, and by the way, David knows both roles, he says, it's all good and it's all mercy forever. That's when you know him. That's when you know his promises. That's when you know his love for you. Goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. Why? Because Jesus does. It's who He is. He embodies these two things, both goodness and mercy. And, and listen, again, remember the sequence. Up, down, up. Sunshine, darkness, sunshine. High, low, high. But it ends in the presence of the King of Kings. So rejoice. You're going through hell on earth? It won't be long before you will be in the very presence of God in heaven. That's a sure deal. Live like it. Sing like it. Pray like it. Act like it. Speak like it. Don't complain. Don't belittle your king. Rejoice in all of his goodness, in all of his provisions, and in all of his protection. Amen. Give God praise in his house today.